the UK. We are very lucky today to have Dr. Priscilla Omanedo joining us, who is the Programme Director for the MSc in Business Information Systems and Business Analysis. Um, and she will be delivering a session for you on what that course involves and what you can look forward to there. And after that, we have my colleague Ewan Griffiths joining us from our careers and placements team. And Ewan has a wealth of experience working with in Indian students and helping them to find jobs and, and to shape their careers after they leave the university. So we're hoping that this is a really, really useful session for you. Uh, for anybody who is interested in any, in any of the courses here today, you can apply after today's session for through SIUK and the counselling team would be ready to help you and this course is available for January as the next intake along with many of our other courses and that leaves me just to hand over to Priscilla. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Tom. Um, so as has already been introduced I am Priscilla and I'm the program director for the MSc Information Systems and Business Analysis. So I'm just going to talk us through a few things about the module, about the um, course. And then towards the end, I'm going to highlight another program that we do offer, which is business analytics. So um, sometimes students get mixed up between both programs. So I thought it'd be useful to actually mention it again here, what the differences are. Okay, so starting off with um, information systems and business analysis, which I would shorten as ISBA. Um, this program is designed for people who are looking to make a career change into the area of IT, or maybe they want to improve their skills um, in order to help them take on roles such as business analysis or IT consultancy. So um, on this program, we get students to learn how to analyze businesses, how to identify problems within a business, um, identify the requirements of a business, and um, put that into um, recommendations to help the business get better. OK, so they get to involve a lot of stakeholders talking to different people at different levels of the company in order to try to understand the business better, um, to be able to know where the problems are um, so they know what you know, solutions to prefer. So these are some of the core um, modules that we offer on this program. So we have the foundation in business systems that um, module is one where we get students to understand some basic concepts around um, business systems okay um, and that's because there are some students that come from very different backgrounds that are not IT related and therefore we thought it would be really useful for everyone to at least start on the same um, footing so even if you're coming from engineering background, for instance, um, psychology, socio um, sociology, um, biology, any background, economics, um, you still have a chance of catching up on the things that are taught on the program by taking, you know, the module foundation in business systems. Um, we also have the consultants toolbox where we get to teach students about the um, tools and techniques that you require um, as a consultant. So what kind of um, techniques would you be, be using to analyze a business, to understand the macro environments in which a business operates or the micro environments in which a business operates, um, to understand the strengths, the weaknesses of the business and the strategic positioning of the business. So these are some of the things that we take you through on that um, module. We then have the Developing Business Systems Workshop. That's um, a hands-on um, module where students get to work as consultants um, and you're all going to be working. So those that do take this mo um, module, you're going to be working on a case that was conducted by um, a senior colleague. So this is a consultancy project that they handled. So we know what the solutions were but obviously with um, growth in technology and things happening, um, we thought, yes, why don't we see what solutions students come up with given the current um, things that we know now? Okay, so that module is as practical as it gets. Every time I have had the chance to speak to our alumni from this module, from this program, they always refer back to this module as the one that always helps them. 
In fact, recently, um, last week or so, I was still talking to an alumna of the program and she was just saying how all this was just copy and paste of what she's currently doing now in her place of work. Okay, so that's one that we are quite proud of. We also take the module managing projects and what this module fo focuses on is to get students to understand how to manage projects. And that's because when you work as an IT consultant or a business analyst, chances are that you're going to be taking on small chunks of projects every now and then, or even big projects. So you wouldn't necessarily um, remain on one particular thing the whole time. You go to a business, you identify what the problems are for that business, deliver the, um, make recommendations, in some cases, deliver the solution yourself, job done, move on to the next thing, okay? So you'll be managing lots and lots of projects in your career life as a business analyst or IT consultant. So um, we thought it would be important for you to understand um, some important principles and basic principles of managing projects. So that's what that module is going to focus on. Then we have the applied research methods and that one prepares you for your dissertation. Okay, so um, later on in time three, you're going to be taking dissertation, um, which could be a strategic dissertation, or it could be um, a business project or um, something applied. So on the ISBA, we have four different types of projects that students can take. Um, they can take a consultancy project, they can take applied projects, where for instance, they design a website or a business or something of the sort. Um, and then we have the academic one where you, for instance, look at a concept and try to understand maybe the factors that influence adoption of something of particular technology. Um, and then we even have opportunity for people to conduct a business plan as part of their um, project. And this is um, something that sets us apart further on the ISB. Again, the dissertation is something that um, I'll talk about very um, shortly. So these are some of the optional modules that we do offer on the program. We have the advanced spreadsheets where we don't just get to, to learn how to use um, Excel at a more advanced level. We also get you to think about um, your strategic use of Excel. For instance, how would you create a dashboard to assist um, in managing registration making? How would you ensure that you're um, designing um, easy to use um, Excel sheets? Okay, for business purposes. You will be introduced slightly to databases, but we're not going to get you to become database administrators. Okay, just introducing you to it. Um, then we have the simulation for manager decision making, where, for instance, you have um, you use a software um, arena to help you identify. Um, which solution would be most optimal for a business. So you might have different options of what you think um, will be useful for, the, for your business and then you try out your ideas. So say for instance, you go into, um, you go into maybe Costa um, or, or a shop where you, or you see that, oh, they're, they're having problems with queue times during lunch period, and you're trying to identify what would be the best solution for them. You can simulate within the um, software what the different um, proposals might be, maybe to increase the number of teals, increase the number of self-service, um, increase the number of workers, and then see which one gives you the optimal result. Okay, um, enterprise resource planning gets you to learn about how you can effectively um, manage resources within um, a business. And then operations management helps you to think about this operations of your of any business that you work for, um, things like supply chain management and things like that. You get to learn on that module. Then we have data mining and business intelligence. And on this module, you get to think about how you um, work with big data in order to help you um, identify trends and things like that for um, a business. Okay, so we have the Aston Global Advantage, which 
all students that come, all postgraduate students that come into the business school have to take. Um, basically, that module gets you to prepare to be prepared for the workplace, and you go through lots of practical things like team working, communications, just to prepare you for the workplace. You also have opportunity of taking internships if you so desire. Um, and then we have the business project, as I already explained earlier. I is based slightly different from many other programs because we have the opportunity for students to conduct you know four different types of projects which has been so useful i usually say to my students your dissertation is the final opportunity you have on the program to plug in a skill gap and the lady i was just talking about earlier um, the project that she did was the main reason why she got the job that she's now working at okay according to her when she went for the interview um they were just talking about that project that was all they focused on and you know We've had other students as well that have been able to plug skill gaps um, as a result of doing their dissertation. Okay, so um, some of the unique selling points of the program um, is that you get to customize your degree, as I've been trying to explain, either through the optional modules or through your dissertation, you decide what you want to get out of the program. Um, and we allow a lot more flexibility with the dissertations. Um, we also have inputs from people within industry and academia. Um, and it's a very useful program. So it's very unlikely that you would work in a business analyst or IT consultant role and not remember some of the things that you learn and say, oh, that's what we were doing, you know, the, because what we're teaching you is going to be quite practical and hands-on and useful. So some of our students over the years have gone on to take um, roles in areas like IT consultancy, IT project management, um, information management, business analysis, systems analysis, data analysis. Again, depending on what your background is, okay um then you that can help you decide which way you want to go for I me mean, since we've had some students go on to become software analysts and that's because they have a background in um, coding and things like that so the entry requirements you would have you you can find this easily on our website um different requirements might be um, might be demanded for um, students from different programs um, across the world, different universities across the world. So um, where you might not be very certain if your um, degree would meet the entry requirements, just send us an email um, or get in touch with, you know, SI um, that's organizing today and they would be able to provide further guidance on, on that. Now, just to touch on very briefly on business analytics. So the ISPA information systems and business analysis is different from the business analytics. Okay, business analytics is also um, run by my department. And what that program is designed for is to get you to think about um, leveraging um, your knowledge or background in maths to be able to help a business or solve business problems. So you're going to be working a lot with big data. There will be things like um, descriptive analytics, uh, performance analytics. So most of the things that you'll be doing to help a business would be through the use of some kind of um, software analysis and using some kind of big data to help the business. So as you can see from the core modules that are offered, on this program is quite different from the kind of core modules that we offer on the ISBA. Okay, so if you're not very strong on maths, if you don't have a very strong mathematical background, you will struggle to even come onto the program. And if you're just about getting, you might even struggle there. But it is still a very valuable program for those who are able to meet the entry requirements and those who are indeed interested in business analytics. So some graduate destinations include um, business analytics, business analysts, um, data scientists, business analytics consultants. So these are some roles that our students have gone on to take. Okay, so um, I just about made it for 15 minutes, which is the time that I was given. Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to talk about um, some of our programs today. If you do have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them when the time comes. Okay, thank you.
Over to you, Tom. Uh, Ewan, were you up next? Yeah, I'm ready to, to move in, if that's what you like. Yes, okay. please. Yep. So Ewan is from our careers team, and he's got a uh, presentation prepared for you guys as well. Hello, everyone. Uh, can I just check? Everyone can hear me. I think you can, yeah. Um, I'm gonna briefly show the video and say hello to you. I won't keep the video on throughout this, but just to, um, to introduce myself. Great to have a chance to talk to you today. My session is focused around, um, just move the slides on. Creating sustainable employability in an uncertain world. Now, um, at Aston, we pride ourselves on looking at employability from several different angles. Sustainable employability is one of them. It relates to not just getting a job on completing your course, which is immediate employment, not just being able to do that job well when you, when you actually join a graduate recruiter, which is essentially um, immediate employability, but sustainable employability is about actually being prepared to manage your career throughout your working life and the many different jobs that you will do as you progress. We all recognize that um, I think even before the world changed seven months ago, that graduates change their career um, sometimes up to six times throughout. As we move into this uncertain world and hopefully move out of it, that we recognize that that will change even more. Um, so this is what I'm gonna focus on. My role as careers consultant is essentially working with postgraduate business students. Um, I've been doing this for a number of years and I'm really delighted to have the chance to speak to you today about some of the issues that you face and some of the things that Aston does to support you as we work through this uncertain world. So, what is actually happening out there at the moment? Well, um, of course, we face, as I'm sure you know, uh, global recessionary conditions. Uh, we will come out of this, but it may take some time. And it's, of course, happening at different paces throughout the world. Um, we recognize on a positive note that the, in the UK, the new gra graduate immigration route, or the graduate route as it's now called, uh, started this September and allows international students not just to work on their tier four student visa, but to continue and remain in the UK for up to two years after that visa ends. And that provides a much sought after opportunity that we've waited to be restored for many years. An opportunity to look for work, an opportunity to gain sponsorship, an opportunity to actually get a chance to work here in the UK. Um, the third thing on this slide, which I think is really important, is this idea around what students need in order to cope in this uncertain world. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, the word cloud with the key word there, resilience. And I think that is going to be more important than it's ever been. The ability to bounce back from setbacks, the ability to actually um, not give up when the going gets tough. And I think for international students, that resilience is more important probably than any other group. From my experience of working with international students, it is not easy finding work in the UK, but those who work really hard to seek it and demonstrate that resilience by continuing to apply and refine and improve their um, application techniques, they will get there. So that's, I think, key things of what it means to be an international student coming to Aston um, as we face these uncertain times. And I want to just to kind of talk about how students progress through that journey. First thing is to talk about is this, what I call Aston student story. And I think storytelling is really powerful. Um, it's important that you think about the story that you are in and you will have a backstory 
and you will have a story in Aston and you will have a forward story. And I really want you to think around about this, your story so far, the story that you anticipate in coming to Aston and working on, and beyond that, although it's unknown, what you expect your story to look like. Now, this is about partnership, and we work together on this. I've never made any um, secret of the fact that the heavy lifting is done by the students themselves, but you have a team behind you, not just your academic team and the wider student support, but also a large team within careers and placements who are there to help you in order to make the best chances to develop employability, to meet employers, and to get into the kind of jobs you're seeking. So the story starts, well, I think it starts where you are now, with the things you're doing, or you have done, and the kind of activities you're involved in that might be to do with the courses you've completed, or you're still on. It might be to do with the internships that you've done. It might be to do with involvement in student societies, or community work, or volunteering, or completing internships of various kinds and work experience that you may even extend it through into full-time work. So what I would like you to think around is this idea that you're a part of this story and that you need to capture that because that's going to be critical in terms of promoting yourself here in the UK and beyond as you start to apply for more opportunities. So really think around what it is you've done already and how this acts as a foundation to what you will do next. Now, in terms of where we go from here, the, being at Aston is an opportunity to drive the student employability experience. Um, the story continues, but I want you to think around what it is as an international student that makes you distinctive and what drives you in your employability when you're here at Aston, because it will be different from other students. It's often about ambition to work in the UK. It's about uh, ambition to get work experience and to develop the skills that you will eventually, in all probability, take home with you. But it's also about the opportunity to build these networks that you need, some of which you will carry throughout your lives as you meet students and employers who you will keep in touch with, I hope, whether not just at Aston, but beyond that. So I'd like you to think around the drivers you have when you're studying here in the UK, what is driving you to success and how engagement with some of the things I'll mention in the next slide is so important to you. Now, when we come to looking at this idea of sustainable employability, what is it that makes us different from uh, other universities and business schools? I'm going to go through each of these four quadrants individually, and this is just the overview, but I wanted to show it you because I think it comes down to four key areas. And I'd like you to think around these and what it is you're hoping to gain from your experience here at Aston. I think it's around work experience and the opportunities you gain. I think it's about getting access to the vacancies that you need to find out what's out there, who's advertising, and don't forget, they're not just advertised roles, but they're often hidden vacancies that you need to seek out. It's about the support you'll get from people like myself and the team that works with me, and it's about the employer contacts you'll get access to. And I want you to think around those four areas. There were others as well. I've not mentioned on here, for example, the opportunity to develop mentoring support by getting involved with some of our schemes or to actually become a part, an active part of student societies. But these are some of the things that uh, really drive this opportunity to develop employability that will be with you throughout your life. Let's start then with the work experience one. And several things I need to point out here. Uh, starting at the top, we were one of the first universities to embrace virtual internships, and we will continue to do that next year, in particular for our postgrad business students, uh, through sponsoring uh, scholarships with an organization called Virtual Internships that offers remote working opportunities globally. They will come in term three. They will be available as part of 
the Aston Global Advantage programme, which I'll say a little bit more about as we work through. And they're a chance to work in teams or individually, where you will use remote working tools, some of which I'm sure you're already using, but which will be essential as we move into a post-pandemic world. Virtual working is here to stay. All the indications are that businesses will never go back to working in mass offices that they did uh, before the pandemic started. And we need to find ways to help you get the skills. Next up on here is um, uh, it's a, a professional development program, which is run, and Priscilla mentioned it in the context of ISBA in the last session. Um, the Aston Global Advantage program happens in, uh, throughout uh, the 12 months you'll spend on MSc programs. There is an equivalent one in the engineering school, but um, I particularly know about the one that happens in the business school, which gives you an opportunity to develop some of the skills needed. And as you move through what's called stream two, which is one of four streams you can pick up in the final term on your master's course. Now, stream two is essentially an opportunity to get work experience in one of many different settings. And virtual internships is one of those, but it could equally be through an internship, through volunteering, through continuation and development of a part-time job, through a business consultancy role. And we've had Indian students who've done that. It can be a whole range of different things, even a job that you start um, while you're at Aston and the student visa, and that's the critical thing, is you would work under your tier four student um, visa, which would give you an extended right to work here in terms of the hours while you are in term three. The other one at the bottom is one again that I'm involved in called the Aston Business Clinic, which is an opportunity to engage in consultancy activity which will give you life business problems. We are working um, on a particular project for an employer that needs a piece of work done. You work as part of a team coaching model and you're given the opportunity to learn about how teams operate to the best advantage. The Aston Business Clinic will be available as Stream 2 and you will have a chance to do this, to apply to do this, and most will be, will be accepted and work as part of that team and develop skills that would be particularly relevant if your interest is working in, in a consultancy type activity. So that could apply to people becoming business analysts or could apply to people wanting to go on to work as, as um, management consultants or much wider range of roles. Vacancies are important. They tell us where the jobs are. And Aston is particularly proud of the systems that we give you access to because you won't find them at every other university. Student Circus is the platform that we subscribe to that gives students access to tier two vacancies for those of you who would look to get sponsored on completion of your undergraduate or your master's course. And that interestingly is a, um, uh, an enterprise that was set up by Indian entrepreneurs, I think about four or five years ago, we have a strong relationship with them and they essentially act as a platform for um, finding and publicizing sponsored roles for all international students here in the UK. It's the go-to place. Grad Connect is a global vacancy platform Again, we subscribe to it, not as many other universities do. In fact, a very small number, I think, from the um, research I've done in the past. And that gives you access to mainly jobs in Europe, North America, and Southeast Asia. So it is truly, truly a global platform that will give you access to, to vacancies that you can apply for um, on, on arriving at Grant at Aston, many are for immediate entry, but getting contacts with companies early on is a good thing. The um, third one, Get Hired, is a European platform that we have access to because we are a triple accredited business school. 
Through EQUIS, the European accreditation, we have membership of the FMD, along with a limited number of very prestige European and business school and, and UK business schools. And again, um, we not just to have access to the vacancies, but we also do a subscription, give you access to careers fairs for European recruitment. The final one on there is probably the most important. And that's because it's the one that you will go to most regularly, and that's Aston Futures, which is our platform for getting vacancies. The vacancies are come to Aston and are free ring fence to us, but also for getting onto our virtual employer fairs, which I'll tell you about in the next slide, for booking appointments, for booking places at careers events. It's a platform that covers everything for careers that you need to know. The employer contacts, you can see already that um, connected there is the EFMD get hired. The virtual fairs is a program that happens in the summer and the autumn. We're now midway through the autumn fairs. And these are uh, one again we subscribe to and you will be competing with top business schools and, and university graduates to actually get vacancies with mainly global multinationals advertising through these fairs. Our own fairs start next week. We have a STEM one, Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths next Thursday. And our business fair is the following Tuesday. And we have over 50 employers at both. And at these fairs, you don't meet employers face to face, but you meet them online. So you will book appointments with them. You can submit your CV and you can use these as an opportunity to build your connections with that employer and actually ask questions, find out more, um, and start the recruitment process. Now, we will also be running some postgrad networking events. These will be mainly next term. I'm hoping some may be face-to-face, -face, but we don't know. If not, you can uh, be sure they will be virtual events because we, in, we make an important emphasis on connecting with local, small and medium enterprises. And in particular at Aston, because we, as Birmingham, is the largest growing tech hub in the UK, we have a particularly large number of fintech companies, startups, technology organisations, who we're proud to say sit on literally the edge of our campus in one of the technology hubs here in Birmingham. And we rely on them to provide many of our networking opportunities alongside a wider range of organisations. Now, in terms of getting support, my role is to help you in terms of understanding the options, to um, teach the, um, on the, and the Aston Global Advantage course to support your development of career management skills, but I'm not alone. We have business development manager and a wider team of business development staff. In total, careers and placements have, I think, between 60 and 70 staff. A lot of staff supporting a lot of students. Um, and our role is to support those links with employers, to enable you to build networks and to get the best time in connecting to employers here at Aston. My role is also the three-term career management program, part of which covers the Aston Global Advantage, but beyond that running other sessions, some involving alumni and focused around particular career areas. And finally, to move on the next slide to introduce something called the Aston Futures Group. And these are three groups that we've run around Indian students for the last two years, Chinese students for much longer, and Nigerian students to work together collaboratively. And we have the first main meeting of the India Futures Group tomorrow, tomorrow lunchtime, where we, we will work together to look at how we can actually find ways to promote particularly the interests of Indian students in terms of their career development and their experience at Aston. So this is a group um, that I hope if you join Aston, you will become involved with because it recognizes that Indian students as other nationalities have particular career needs and we try to shape them to meet those needs in a specific way. 
Now, as I move to the end, I want to introduce you to Dipti um, because her story is an interesting one. She started, as you can see, um, by doing a BTEC. She had as well about a year and a half of experience and she joined the ISBA, which of course Priscilla has spoken about in the earlier session. And she's with us and now completing. But the critical thing in her story was of course her master's and the opportunities that gave for skill development through the modules and the projects and the um, exposure to staff and practitioners, but also through the things she became involved with in that green panel at Aston. So she didn't just turn up for a course, but she went out and did stuff. She was what I would call an activist and is an activist by getting um, positions that were going to and have given her skills that have become really useful in getting what happened. A paid internship with a company called Terex, which was part of uh, a research group and completing a, her company dissertation as well. Now, we don't know how Dipti's story will end. Of course, we don't. She may well have the chance to continue and is seeking to work here in the UK. And she um, may well stay on. Um, she may well return to India. But her experience at Aston, um, I know from talking to her many times, has been a rich and varied one. It's given her the chance to get that internship and, I hope, further experience should she stay on here in the UK. So, it all depends on you and us. You, but you derive your, narr your narrative, your storyline. You'll need to work to your strengths and understand what they are, as well as the areas that you need to work on, the gaps you need to fill, the skills you need to develop and find those opportunities with us to develop them. The story will end um, in the case of the alumni listed here, in exciting opportunities for setting up businesses or going into multinationals or smaller organizations. It depends on you and us and how we work together. But alumni are part of that story because they connect you to the future and what you will do. And that is really all I want to say. At this stage, I'm going to um, leave the slide on and open the question. But um, can I pass the mic over to someone else? Yep, yeah, that's no problem at all. So uh, thank you very much to uh, Priscilla and to Ewan for wonderful presentations from both of you. Um, Bhavna, Deepika, I believe that we've got some questions from viewers today. Yes. So let's start the question answer session. The first question, what are the top five employers for Aston graduates? Ewan, that's got to be one for you. <laughs> it's very interesting. I was actually looking at some of the data on that, fortunately, um, earlier this week. And I kind of look at it from, from two angles. Our LMI specialist gives us some really useful stuff. Um, and I may not get this exactly right, but it will give you a flavor of what it is. So the LMI data is good, but also you can find this information by going in and starting to look at the Aston alumni tool on LinkedIn, because that also gives us some really interesting and rich source of understanding about who Aston grads go to work for and where. Now, in terms of the, the, top, the top ones from my recollection of the LMI data, it was not surprisingly that it was uh, organizations like PwC and Accenture who are on campus, but also FDM, major recruitment consultant, quite in, in many ways quite an interesting business model, a company you may not have heard of because it doesn't kind of have the, 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 if you like, the brand kudos that PwC and Accenture would have. But those typically are among the larger employers, uh, technology consultancies, business services providers, um, technology organizations, and interestingly, quite a number of, of people, um, graduates from Aston, come to work for Aston as well. And some of those will work for our departments. Some of them will, of course, um, perhaps in the alumni, will probably be, um, they may be postdoc students who are doing some work at Aston as part of their, their continuing research. 
So that gives you a flavour of um, the top uh, the top type of employers. They um, they incorporate the sectors I've mentioned already. They will also encompass um, some of the uh, the large manufacturers, but in reality, a large number of our students will go and work for small and medium enterprises. And so what we need probably to hold in mind is that although those figures are interesting and that, that data uh, in terms of LMI is an, an indication of the kind of organizations, and they are, again, indicative of where the opportunities for graduates generally are. So the big five, the big four, for example, will absorb a massive number of graduates across the UK. But I would stress that actually they may not be the most interesting or unusual of the jobs that are asked in grads to go to. Those may often be with startups, with small and medium enterprises, with companies that we, you and I have possibly never heard of. So I hope that answers the question in a broad way interesting what you say about alumni working for the university because I'm an Aston alumni and if I'm remembering this correctly I think Priscilla's also an Aston alumni so that's interesting. Such a popular place. Yes that's correct. <laughs> I mean it, it's 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 quite interesting and I suppose this is this is a vote of confidence in Aston. Among the queries I get um, from students, how would you get to work for Aston? <laughs> how do you get to work for Aston? And you know, it's 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 not easy, but not impossible. Priscilla may, may have well come through as an international student herself, um, but um, we have international students working in our in our marketing department. We have international students working for careers and placements as well, um, but. Again, hold in mind that it will be many and varied. So what I think when looking at the your target employers, yes, it's good to have a goal. It's good to look if they sponsor. And you know, this, this kind of brings a really important point on here, which many of you will, uh, will be aware of already. Sponsorship under tier two is a big thing if you want to stay long-term to work in the UK. Um, tier five, of course, is an option if you're looking for short-term uh, work experience for one year. Um, but also, it's important to understand when you're looking at, at employers, and I have a story to tell here. Um, one of our Indian students, Adi, who I hope is going to join us at the India Futures Group tomorrow, he just, just started a job actually in London. He's one of last year's uh, grads, and he's such an inspiration character because if he is not, if he is not a, an indication of resilience, then nobody is. And I've you know, have been in contact with him many times over the last 12 months and supported him, but he got the job off his own back eventually. And he got it by identifying those companies on the register of employers, those who are registered and licensed to, work, to, to sponsor and starting to identify companies that way. And this, again, what we need to recognize is that these are people who can sponsor I don't necessarily do, but that's how Addy got the role. And that's an interesting, interesting story to tell on that one. I think, I think it's interesting. I hope you do. Next question. Is the post-study work visa still in place? It's back in place. Um, we lost it for about eight years and it's back. So it's, um, it's great to welcome, to welcome it home. Because um, universities were, were UK universities were lobbying for for eight years uh, to get this back, and it returned this year in this September for students. It's now called the graduate route, but I think people still call it post study, allowing you to work for up to two years afterwards. Um, there are no requirements in terms of skill level for the, the jobs you go into. Um, I think the salary is based around the um, the, the the living wage. So there's enormous flexibility in the way you do it. There are requirements, but you know, if you study a complete your undergraduate or postgraduate degree, then they should be fulfillable. And we hope that this is going to be the big gateway that will enable international students to have much longer to get that job in the UK that they lost for so long. Next question. Are there scholarships available for Jan Intake and what's the deadline? 
Yes, there are scholarships available. So we still have the Aston Global Excellence Scholarships available. So for students who've got uh, high grades, high GPAs in their bachelor's degrees who are applying to Aston, if, if your grades meet the minimum levels that we set, then uh, you may be eligible for a three and a half thousand or a five thousand pound scholarship. We do also have Global Ambassador and Vice Chancellor's scholarships available, and they have a deadline uh, for the first round of the 9th of November uh, for students to submit a written application after they've got their offer. So if you're thinking that you want to apply for one of these courses and, and one of these uh, scholarships, now is a good time to apply. You should have enough time to get your offer and submit your scholarship statements before that 9th of November deadline. And those scholarships are worth £3,000 for the Global Ambassador Scholarship and £8,000 for the Vice Chancellor Scholarship. Next question. I have 105 Duolingo score, which is equivalent to 6.5 IELTS. Is this okay for MBA? No, we require a score of 115 on Duolingo. Next question. What is employability rate for postgraduates? Right, that will vary course by course, year by year. Um, it's it's high. The um, we we work on the basis of um, our, our benchmark for across the university is eighty percent into graduate level positions, which we generally hit. Um, it comes out. It's published quite a long way. Um, in terms of coming out. So it's, it's kind of difficult for us to, to start to publish this um, in a meaningful way because it takes one and a half years to collect the data. So the way I actually approach it in, in informing students about employability is creating what are called career profiles. So if you want to know about the kind of employers who are taking on and have taken on students in different subject areas, including the ISBA, which does have a published profile. I don't have it for business analytics, interestingly, because we're still compiling one and a half years and on, um, and that's a relative business analytics link has been around three or four years. So we're still building up data, uh, a critical mass of data for that group. So just to summarize, it's good, it's strong, but it varies year by year, and it may change um, by the time you can and by the time you complete. But if you wish to have um, data about the vacancies we know students have taken up, the jobs they've gone into, the, the organizations they're working for, and the locations, I will try to get that to you. Thank you. The next question. I don't have family members in Birmingham, can students from India socialize during pandemic? So the UK recently uh, changed the, the way in which it was operating the kind of pandemic regulation here in the UK. So I think Birmingham is now a tier two uh, level, which means that uh, socialization is restricted. Um, there's still obviously lots that you can do online and the students union is facilitating online get togethers and stuff like that constantly. Um, and there would be options to do some limited things <clears throat> right now, but then hope, we're hopeful that with these restrictions that are in place right now, that we see the number of cases in the local community reduce and that we'd be able to loosen up the restrictions so students could do a bit more, but it, it, it's not, um, a normal level of socialization right now it's definitely under some restrictions um obviously students now are looking at january and it, we, we can't know what the situation is going to be in january we will keep people informed via our website and there's a really good covid web page on the university homepage. so if you just go to the university's homepage and scroll down a little bit you can then see the covid information to see exactly uh, what, what students are and aren't able to do and stuff like that um I mean, I can just add how um, the, the group that I'm working with and the activities that I'm working um, with the AGA team are a great way for students to actually meet each other and develop skill opportunities. It's all being done, of course, almost in, almost all online. But you know, the Indif Indi Futures group as a WhatsApp group up and running. I understand, um, and it's a chance to start to to actually build networks 
that will prove an important social connector, but also an important career driver as well. This applies to becoming involved with student societies and the kind of um, the, the, the um, I guess we call them civic activities that many of our students are, are connecting to on the MSc courses. These are great ways to work collaboratively in tough times and it's being done online. And amazingly, so much is being achieved online. The Aston Business Clinic, I mentioned earlier, that was all done virtually. Teams set up and they communicated and they delivered to employers all remotely. And I don't know whether anyone believed it would work. Perhaps I was one of the doubters, but I was proved wrong. When you see how much can be achieved through remote working and through remote activity, it's not the same, of course, as being in the same room, but we work with what we, the times we're in. And this is, um, this is kind of part of our new way of living at the moment. I, yeah, and I'd have, I've seen um, some of the different student societies have been doing activities as well. And I've seen them posting screenshots where they've been doing virtual meetups and, and different bits. So there's still that side of things going on. I think there's another side to that question, though. And um, Priscilla, I wonder if you could tell us a bit. I guess you maybe started teaching now. Are you teaching this term? I don't know. Sorry. Yes, I am teaching this term. And one of the things that we're trying to do for our students is um, on campus touch points. So we're encouraging students as much as possible to come on campus um, to meet us. I am also encouraging my students to get in touch with each other. So they have a WhatsApp group for um, the class, which other programs have as well. Um, and that helps them to get in touch with each other, make sure that everything is going okay. And then there are other events that um, I would be planning as well, just to get students to have that interaction. Yeah. So the, the teaching side of it, although not normal, again, we are still doing a lot that brings the students together and brings the students together with their academics too. So there's still a lot of connectivity, even if, if people aren't in the same room. Yeah. Next question. Is there psychology available in this university? Yes, there is. Um, there's a couple of different types. So we've got an undergraduate degree in psychology, um, which is British Psychological Society accredited. We have got a master's degree in health psychology and we have uh, master's degrees in work and business psychology as well. Um, and they've got slightly different entry requirements and things like that. But we, we should hopefully have a course that would suit people's interests and help them to develop. And then uh, it's slightly around the subject, but at undergraduate level, we also have neuroscience where they would consider some psychology aspects as well um, and look at perhaps some of the more biological effects of different psychological disorders or drivers of different psychological disorders so there's a few different ways of looking at it too with the different courses that we have next question please tell about the job opportunities and the expected average salary <laughs> in terms of average salary, uh, one of the things we are able to, uh, you know, pleasingly report is that Aston students do do really quite well. So in the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes Survey, uh, which was done this, this year uh, by The Economist magazine, I think, uh, Aston graduates were found to have an average salary in their first year after graduating, £4,000 higher than the UK average. And that average that, that grows across uh, three years up to £5,000. And I think it grows uh, across five years too. I will just check. Uh, yeah, over five years, that grows to an £8,000 difference. So Aston graduates do earn a good salary when they graduate on average. Next question. Is this related to business schools only? <laughs> Priscilla's talk, yes. Priscilla is a member of the faculty in the business school. Ewan's talk, uh, I think Ewan's experience is more hands-on with the business school, but the yeah. careers and placement service is there for all students. And there are people, I think, in Ewan's department, I mean, you can tell 
better than me who would specialize in the different engineering career options and different options for students from our health and life sciences school as well absolutely yeah um all, the, all our careers consultants will have some area of specialization undergraduate postgraduate and they will bring a depth of knowledge to careers in that area that will reflect that experience of the students they work with each of the each of the undergrad and postgraduate programs will have careers happening within the curriculum in some uh, place but alongside that there is this extended careers program which means that on any lunchtime on after futures there are probably two or three careers related activities happening which might actually create problems of choice um, a little bit like going to a supermarket and finding five different types of chopped tomato um, but we know that you are likely to be discerning consumers and we'll work out what's going to be best for you and you know part of my job is to help you to to actually establish which is going to give you most value in terms of attending in terms of online sessions um, and using all those resources the best advantage next question what are the requirements to get the scholarships um, as I mentioned, the Global Excellence Scholarship is academic based, so that's strictly on your bachelor's degree or your 12th grades. Um, but for the Global Ambassador Scholarship, I am one of the scholarship assessors there. Uh, there's three short statements we're looking for students to write, and uh, they would revolve around your kind of aspirations as an alumni, what you feel you can bring to the university community, and, and why you think you benefit from the scholarship. So we're looking to see good answers to those questions. Um, I don't want to read the same thing over and over again. So I'm not really going to give examples of what people should write about, but um, just make sure that you've put some thought and some effort into it and, and that you've tried to address the question. Next question. I applied to engineering management MSc on 30th September. When can I expect accept expect the decision oh yep so our pg admissions team have been working on enrollments up until the end of last week um and of the new student intake so they're just now coming to focus on the january and september next year intakes so they do have a backlog and they are trying to work through it but it you know we've got a lot of interest for these courses um especially from Indian students, especially for the January intake. So they do have quite a backlog, but we, we, we're in touch with students and we know that offers are going out now. So um, hopefully they will get to your application soon. Just make sure you keep an eye out, make sure you check your junk and spam folders because sometimes they email for a little extra information and it goes to there. And if you're in any doubt, you can get in touch with your SIUK counsellor or you can contact our team on uh, the email address Aston India office at aston.ac.uk. Next question. Hi, I'm studying in 12th majors, has science group. I'm able to study law further as my grad degree. Sorry, Deepka, I'm not sure I got the question. So this student is doing their 12th and they're doing the science stream. Did yeah, say, but he it, wants but he wants to opt at law as his profession in graduation. I don't see a problem with that. Um, so as long as the grades are good in the subjects that he's studying, I don't think that would be an issue for the undergrad law program. Next question. What is the total tuition fees to study here? Also, can a graduate with commerce degree take up this course? Oh, Priscilla, can a graduate with a degree in commerce take up the ISBA program? Um, we need to look at a bit more than just the degree um, where it's um, outside of an IT degree. So where a student, for instance, is coming from a commercial degree, um, we would look at whether they have an understanding of IT. Um, or maybe from work experience, there are things that they can transfer, transferable skills and things like that. Um, particularly of concern is where they see their career going. So we don't just want students to come onto the program, 
um, without having a clear idea where they see their career going. So in such cases, they would usually pass them on to me and I uh, would conduct an interview with the students. Um, but apart from that, there are some baseline requirements um, that the admissions team would look into first before it gets to that level. Um, and I don't have that information with me. <laughs> That's okay. So I think those baseline requirements really are going to be that there's an English qualification of some kind. Even if, um, you know, any of us were applying to the university, we'd still have to demonstrate a qualification to show our English standard. Um, they would need to see evidence of degree level study, so a bachelor's degree, and then it would get to the stage that Priscilla's describing, where they'd look at the transcripts, look at the modules that have been studied and check that they were suitable for the course. Um, Priscilla's course does have some specific requirements, as she mentioned, but there are some courses that have more general, more flexible entry requirements that students could consider as well. Uh, in terms of tuition fees, for the MSc programs in the business school, we're generally looking at a range between about 17 and 20,000 pounds, going up to 26,000 pounds for the MBA. Um, but for every Aston course, there is a web page that has the exact tuition fee confirmed on that page. So if you've got any doubts, you can just go to our website, type in the name of the course that you want to study, and it will bring back the web page and show you exactly what your tuition fee would be. Next question, please provide MPhil or PhD in management admission and full scholarship details. For full scholarship details, we have already provided link on the live chat box. You can go to that link and for uh, you can answer this thumbs now. Yep, so we don't operate a MPhil degree at Aston for students to apply to. That's uh, an award that we would give to a PhD student who only completes their first year of their PhD, as I understand it. Uh, PhD admissions are open. Uh, students would need to have a, um, a research proposal uh, that they'd need to submit, and that would be submitted to the school um, and would then be shared with the academics in that department to review uh, before uh, considering to take the application further. Priscilla, I don't know if, if um, you do or if you don't assess PhD students or take on PhD students in your role. And if you could kind of give any advice or guidance on what, what would be looked for in a research proposal, say? Yeah, um, so if we're having um, an interview with a PhD candidate or somebody who wants to come in to um, study a PhD with us, one of the things that we look out for is if they have... Um, some understanding of how to conduct research. So if you know that, for instance, you need to have an aim, you need to have objectives, what the objectives would be, and um, you've done some kind of background study as well um, before presenting that. So you don't want to tell us that you're gonna do something that somebody else has already done without any novelty in what you're bringing on board. There also needs to be um, clear motivation. Why do you want to do a PhD? Where do you see your career going from there? Um, what kind of contribution are you looking to make either to industry or to academia? Um, those are the questions that you're going to be asked. And those are some of the things that we'll be looking out for. Um, in your proposal, we also want to see that um, you can demonstrate good written um, and um, good quality, um, good presentation. So, we would look at the proposal and from the proposal, we can guess if, okay, this student fairly has an idea of, you know, conducting the research or not. Um, so do your homework, um, really important before coming on board um, with application. The other thing I would say is if you can get a supervisor, somebody who is potentially interested in your PhD before you apply, it makes the process a lot quicker than if you just sent an application and then it was sent down to academic departments because then it will just keep going around forever um, unless it stands out um, enough to grab someone's attention otherwise it would just go there and if they can't find anybody to be interested it's going to get rejected so uh, how would you advise that students make that connection priscilla with a potential supervisor um, within our department, for instance, we do have a web page where we have all of our academics listed. Um, so when you go onto our academic page, 
Um, so if you Google something like operations and information, that's for my department at least, you might not be interested in my department. So you look for the department um, and go to the staff listing. Um, I want to believe that all departments within the school have this staff listing as well. Go on there, find out what their research interests are, see what they've been doing in terms of um, publications, conferences, teaching um, activities. And that would give you an idea of um, whether this person would be interested in what you're looking to do then once you find a potential supervisor or someone you think will be a supervisor send an email to them now the last thing you want to do is to send the same email to five ten people in the same department because chances are somebody in that department is going to forward it to the whole group and then it now becomes very obvious that these students really doesn't know what they want they just you know casting their breads upon many waters and things which is not going to be really um, helpful. So don't, yeah, try not to do it, okay? And if you um, have contacted two people, be transparent to say, I've also sent an email to Professor This, um, and I'm looking, I would I'm very delighted if we can all work together because you would have more than one page supervisor so that they know that you are specifically targeted, just the both of them for that research then it will probably draw their attention in a bit more than, you know, just sending emails randomly to all members of, of the department. So I've just shared, uh, Bhavna, if you're able to reshare, links that uh, are for Aston Business School. And in that link, it's actually the support staff, but there are links to the different academic groups. Um, and I've shared a link to Priscilla's academic group, the Operations and Information Management Group, so you can see Priscilla. Uh, and I've shared links for the Engineering and Physical Sciences uh, academics as well. So if people wanted to go and have a look at our academics profiles, they can do that online through those links. Next question. As per Aston website, they have mentioned they require below 100 of pre-sessional and for direct admission, they require 110 Duolingo. My score is between 105. That, a score of 105 would be okay for a pre-sessional program, um, which our admissions team would refer you to. Uh, I'm not sure where they've seen that on the website. The minimum that we um, require for Duolingo for direct entry would be 115. Deepika, was there any other questions? Yes, yes, there is. What is the deadline for January intake? And is there any chance to submit my IELTS report later after applying the application for Jan intake? Yes, uh, there, there's not a firm deadline for the Jan intake, but I would definitely recommend that students get their applications in soon, especially if they want to apply for a scholarship. Um, but um, in terms of applying before you've got the IELTS results, that's that's no problem at all. Students can do that, and we would make what we call a conditional offer, so an offer based on uh, them achieving a minimum IELTS grade in the future. Next question: Is there computer science undergrad available in this university? Yes, and cybersecurity as well, uh, and both those courses would take students uh, directly from twelfth standard. Next question, what is the required score in IELTS for MSc management? That would be a 6.5 overall with a 6 in each section. Okay, can you please talk about English department, specially related to all? What other English courses are available, such as Delta and Celta, inside the campus? Um, I'm sorry, but I don't know what Delta and Celta are. Uh, within the School of uh, Languages and Social Sciences, there are master's degrees available in TESOL uh, and translation studies, which would look uh, more at the theory of translation rather than actual translation itself. So you don't require uh, any specific language um, to join that course. So people who studied from any language degree previously would be able to join that course. Um, we do also have undergraduate language degrees too. 
Uh, so things like Mandarin, French, Spanish, for example. The last question, university provide free English test exam instead of UK band? Um, fortunately not. Uh, no, we did used to run a, a English test in the summer, but it, it wasn't something that... Um, it, it was one of those things. It's not something that we were actually very good at. <laughs> um, so rather than do that, we switched to accepting the Duolingo test, which is a fairly straightforward test that many students take. It gives fast results um, and it has got uh, it's proved very, very popular with our Indian students. The university does also accept 12 standard English for entry. So we would require a grade of 75 percent or above for entry uh, from CBSE or ICSE boards or a grade of 80% and above from state boards. Um, so there is that option there as well for students to take. Thank you so much. We are done with all the questions. Anything else you guys want to mention on this live chat? Just a, a big thank you for uh, from us for attending the live chat today. We hope that you uh, feel encouraged to apply to Aston or if you've applied already that you feel encouraged to accept your offer and come join us. Um, and I would personally like to thank Ewan and Priscilla for giving up their time to come and join us today um, for their presentation. And I, I don't know if there's anything further that they would Sorry want to, to interrupt, but we have two more questions. Okay. <laughs> normally how much time does it take to get off get offer i think they're talking about job offer to get a job offer yeah mm -hmm. normally Ooh. how much time it takes oh. you in? Offer oh, sorry um, a job offer. <laughs> i was i thought an offer was relating to the um to the, the offer of a place it will vary with large companies it can take several months um, we're finding that for graduate training programs, the application process is starting now for entry, and in fact may have started even earlier than September or before, for entry in September 21, and that application can extend right through until Easter, if you take into account each of the stages. So the stages can go from initial online application to psychometric tests, to video interview, to assessment center that can take several months to complete and for a decision to be made. Thank you for the answer, answer you can be much quicker. Uh, yeah, so actually the student is referring to uh, offer letter from the university. That's no problem at all. So if it's a postgraduate application, uh, we would normally aim to make a, an offer within about a week. Um, now. For students who have already applied, as I mentioned, there's a bit of a backlog because of us just having had the September enrollment period. So we're just working through that now. But when the admissions team get caught up, they normally can make an offer within a week. Uh, for undergraduate courses, it depends on when students apply. In the UK, there's a really, really big peak in the January uh, when we see most of the UK students apply in, in about the same week, um, which means that we have a big backlog that we need to work through in late January into February, sometimes into March. So around then it can be delayed. But again, the UG admissions, it would normally be about a week. Um, the offer will come as an email. It won't come as an offer letter. Now, I know that for some PG students, they'd need an offer letter to be able to get a bank loan, and the university can provide that on request. Uh, so you just need to get in touch with us. Again, at Aston India office, uh, aston.ac.uk. Next question. Could you please tell me much knowledge in linguistics is required to join MA to solve? There would be, we would need to see um, evidence of like bachelor's level study in a related degree. Um, so it would need to be something similar to linguistics. Say, for example, you had done um, a bachelor's degree in business that wouldn't be suitable for progression to the master's degree in TESOL. Uh, if you've got any concerns or doubts around that, you can send in your certificate to us at uh, Aston India office at aston.ac.uk. And we would be happy to check your documents and to give you an indication of whether or not it would be worth you applying. So we are done with all the questions. 
Okay, thank you. I, I, I think when we were wrapping up just now, I just I'd said my thanks and was just offering uh, Ewan and Priscilla the chance to add any comments that they had. Uh, I've just got one more excellent piece of good news. I've just literally had an email from one of our Indian students in this year saying she's had a job offer. For an awesome. How cool is that? <laughs> Which one? Is it someone that we... Pachi I would Sharma, know. you know, Pachi Sharma. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. Hot news, great stuff. So pleased to share that with you. <laughs> and the only thing but otherwise to say was thank you very much for taking part. Excellent questions. Really good questions. Thank you. So yes, much. and thank you for yeah, thank you for having us, and thank you for um, all your questions. If you do have anything else you would like to ask us, I mean, feel free to get in touch. Thank you so much, much. all for your time. Yeah, it was so we are ending over here. Thanks very much. Okay, take care. Thank, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, uh, Bhavna and Devika. For thank you. Session. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.